morning. My name is Eric Bowling. I'm with IPC Technologies, and we welcome all of our participants. So today's session is about mobility and road warriors. Um, this is for the people who spend a lot of time away from their desk. You need to be available uh, wherever your office is, which is wherever your feet are or wherever you're sitting. And so what Mitel offers is a suite of mobility applications that allow you to stay as communicative with your business partners as possible, allowing you to keep your existing device, your personal device, yet have two identities on that device. I have my personal Eric Bowling and my professional Eric Bowling on my phone. And so I have the ability to switch between those two, to chat with my wife if I want to on my personal side of my identity and my coworkers and business partners uh, on the business side, all from the same device, making and receiving calls based on the identity I want to present. I make a call from a business perspective, you get my business number. I make it from my personal cell phone and that is my personal number. So what we want to do is just look at this application. We're going to start, <coughs> excuse me, just a quick review of what it looks like from an end user perspective. I'm going to do that. And then our very own Kurt Wright is going to show some of the applications of how to administer, uh, how to create uh, the, the, the mobile solutions within your My Voice Connect. Now, we will be looking at the My Voice Connect mobility solution, but there are very similar offerings for our My Voice business as well. So the, the applications look a little differently based on whether or not you are a Heritage Shortel customer or a Heritage Mitel customer that have come to the Mitel family. So, but today we're going to be spending most of our time looking at the uh, applications for My Voice Connect. So hopefully that is, uh, that's clear to everybody. Um, and so one of the things I am going to do here now is I am going to show you my... Let's see here. I am bet that reflector. There we go. Okay. So what I've done is I've switched over to my iPhone. So hopefully all of you are seeing my iPhone here. There's some email, personal emails there. Here's my picture of my uh, fun four kids. Uh, they look so happy there. So this is Eric's iPhone, right? And this is my live iPhone. You can see me swiping back and forth. This is a live one here. And if you look down here at the bottom, you have a green phone on the left that says five, meaning I've got some voicemails or missed calls. And then you have a blue phone on the right hand side. If I want to call you from Eric Bowling, the father of four, husband to Cindy, I press the green side and I, you know, simply make the phone call as I normally would from my iPhone. Okay. However, if I want to present myself as Eric Bowling, the IPC executive, I can come here and this is my application, right? I've got my ability to change myself to in a meeting, available, out of the office. Uh, let's see, I've got it linked up here. There we go. Um, I've got my events, so I have my, my calendar integrated to this. This is the go-to webinar here, Attention Road Warriors at 2 o'clock, where I've got my events pushed into this application. I've got the activity, my calls that I've made and received in the past. Uh, I've got my instant messaging capabilities here that are instantly available on my mobile device. So you can see all the instant messages that I've uh, that I've completed through uh, through the just the hist history of using this application on my phone here. When I look at my recent calls, I've got my call history. My calls missed, my calls to, uh, all calls, those types of things. Just like my My Voice Connect application, if I use that on my desktop, I have this same experience with this information on my mobile device. Here's my calendar of events. I've got all my contacts. I have integrated my personal contacts, but I also have the ability, let's say I wanted to look up... Uh, Kurt right here, I could look up, oh, got to spell his name right, Kurt, talking and typing, I search the enterprise directory here, I got a couple of matches, and there's my contact for Kurt Wright, click, hit the button, and it places the call to him. 
So I just wanted to walk people through a little bit about how the mobile client looks and feels. If you are a My Voice Connect customer and you use the Connect client on your desktop, you will observe that it's the same look and feel. It's a similar type of uh, application. Settings up here in the upper right-hand corner, I can change how it, how it handles Wi-Fi calling or data calling, some other settings. You know, those are some more troubleshooting and more advanced capabilities that we won't get into today uh, unless some of the questions want to demonstrate and show those things. Uh, but the uh, the idea is that, again, if I am a corporate user also using my phone as my personal device, my training is if you want to call as your personal identity, click the green button. And if you want to call from your professional identity, click the blue button. And here we launch the application. Got my dial pad here. I can type a phone number, 804-285-9300. Place that call and essentially what happens is this call will go out I'm calling my IPC account here go on speakerphone so right or if you know your party's extension you may so, very similar experience for an end user blue versus green personal versus professional uh, very simple to use you can see my in-call controls here on this I can add callers I can uh, transfer calls, put them on hold, put them on speaker. It's as though I've taken my desk phone off of my desk and put it in my pocket and carrying it around with me all in that mobile device. Something a lot of road warriors would appreciate. There, I've hung up the phone and now I'm back to my normal window here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn that piece off, quit sharing that here, stop mirroring. Okay. So now uh, what I'd like to do is I would like to hand this over to Mr. Kurt Wright. Uh, let me just check and see if there are any quick questions from our attendees yet. I do not see. Let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah, there is a question here about some additional hardware and software licenses. So, um, yes, there are additional uh, hardware ramifications if you would like to add this to your system and so uh, if you want to find out more about that you can contact your account manager to investigate uh, what do I have today what am I licensed for today what do I need to add again some of our customers have this solution and are just getting a refresh others may have it and some of you may or may not know whether you have the your existing system capable to do this today. So um, just reach out to your account manager and um, they will, uh, they'll help you facilitate what it will take to, get, to implement this solution. Excellent question. Okay, so let's see. I am gonna stop my sharing. I'm gonna move this over to Mr. Wright. Okay, so Kurt, you should have the ability to now share your screen or just begin speaking to, uh, to the solution. Kurt? Okay. okay, Eric, thank you very much. Um, everyone, my name is Kurt Wright. I'm one of the senior engineers uh, and work with a lot of our implementation teams here at IPC. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And Eric, I'll thank you for using me as your uh, your demo in your, um, in your iPhone. And for those of you who are taking notes, you now have my direct cell number. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I want to make sure <laughs> that's quite all right. Um, it's, uh, I, I am a mobility user, so if you dial my direct extension, um, you get that call to go to my um, my mobility client on my iPhone anyway. Um, I want to make sure, Eric, if you can, if I'm presenting and you can see the yes, looks on good. the screen. Yep, excellent. Okay, I'm a little farther away. Okay, very good. Um, so Eric asked me if I could speak a little bit to the um, architecture and the infrastructure that makes this work. Um, I am going to do my best to do that in a way that is uh, meaningful for you folks, but doesn't go too, too far into the weeds. Um, and then I'll give you a quick view uh, into uh, the interfaces, which you may or may not have seen, uh, on some of the components where we configure these. Um, at, at a high level, as Eric said, you're, you're basically taking um, 
your, your desk phone and putting it in your pocket and carrying it with you. In reality, what you're doing is you're, you're creating an extension that runs on your smart device, either your iPhone or Android, um, that links back into your PBX system uh, via the mobility router, which is this component here, if you see my mouse move. Um, it ties back into the PBX, uh, and it pairs to your corporate extension. So the way that kind of works is um, it leverages the capability and the knowledge of the smartphone, right, the dual-mode smartphone, to know if it has Wi-Fi capability, if it has... Um, cellular data capability, uh, if it has internet Wi-Fi access, or just cellular, just to make a cell call. Um, and the application on the phone recognizes that and then reaches back to the mobility router through several different mechanisms. Um, if I am strictly Wi-Fi, right, if I'm say I'm, I'm out in at my house at home, um, and I'm, my, my cell phone is connected to my home Wi-Fi, uh, it will actually come through the Internet, uh, comes through the firewall into the mobility router, uh, and the, the mobility router knows now that it is connected so I can place a call that sends that signal to the mobility router, which then signals back into the PBX. Um, if I'm strictly cellular, um, let's say I'm out in the middle of Hanover County where there there aren't any good cell towers, um, or they don't, you know, they don't have um, high-speed internet access for the cell phone. Um, if I go to place that call, the application recognizes that and says I can't complete the call through this internet path. So what it then does in turn, it actually places a cell call to the cell access number and dials in. And it recognizes my phone because of provision. And it says, okay, this, this is an authorized caller. So it reaches back into the PBX and it creates a call and it links those two together. So this, this capability actually extends even a little further when you think about that, its ability to understand that it can connect through my Wi-Fi here at the office, which is basically local Wi-Fi, it can connect through cellular data, or it can connect through, um, you know, remote Wi-Fi at my house. Um, it has the ability, and um, I, I, I started to say something, but I didn't want to interrupt when Eric had his demo up, and he was in, he had called into the office, and he had that active call up. I don't know if you noticed. There's actually a button on there that said handover. Uh, it has the ability to start a call on the Wi-Fi. I can actually get up, walk out of my office, get in my car, start driving away, and when the Wi-Fi signal becomes low, it can actually hand that call over to the cell data. So I've actually gotten up, left the office, driving away, and I'm still on the same phone call, but that phone call has moved from the Wi-Fi to the cellular data. When I get to my house and my phone connects to my Wi-Fi at the house, I can hand that call back over again and switch it back over to avoid the call, um, which is a pretty, it's a pretty good, a pretty good technology. Um, the thing to be aware with that is it's always better to let the customer know that you're talking to. I'm going to hand this call over because there's a little bit of a delay as a transition, so you don't want the other person to think that you've you know, dropped the call. Um, so just if you set that expectation, they wait and, and then the call goes through. But that's the knowledge. You know, Kurt, I've, to, to that, Kurt, to that point, I've personally found that when you go from cellular to Wi-Fi, uh, a lot of times the call mm -hmm. quality actually goes gets better on a Wi-Fi call versus the cellular network. Sometimes I think we we get used to uh, call quality that is not toll toll based quality. Um, that uh, on cellular phones and the like, and I personally have found that calls over Wi-Fi are actually cleaner and crisper and have better volume than on the cellular piece. So uh, that's just been my personal experience when handing off between a Wi-Fi versus a cellular-based call uh, with the system. Right. So 
just wanted to bring that capability out because that that is one of the real value adds of the uh, of the system. Um, but going back to this, the, your corporate phone night extension here, um, where we say it looks like that fade extension everywhere, um, it, it's actually a paired extension. Um, so in, in the diagram, you could actually have like a little ghost extension right here next to it. And um, any of you who've used uh, the additional phone capability, um, that's what makes the mobility extension ring. And it's important to bring that out when we go into the next slide um, where we talk about what these uh, little lines here actually mean. Um, and the reason for that is that um, it's to tell you that you can then control when that call does and doesn't come to the mobility extension via your, um, your call handling mode. Um, if you're familiar with this or not, I'm, I can show you this briefly short in, in just a few minutes. Um, you can control through a call handling mode when the call will ring an additional phone. And this actually pairs as an additional phone. And what that means is this. If I'm sitting here at my desk and I'm working and I'm getting a phone call in, well, I'm sitting right here with my headset on my, my desk phone right here. I, I kind of really don't need my cell phone to ring. <laughs> so um, some, a lot of people find that very annoying. Um, so in my available in my availability state of available, I can set it to not ring the additional phone. So I don't receive that call. If I'm out of the office uh, and someone dials my, my direct extension, I do want that call to come. So in that call handling mode, then I make sure that it does ring the additional phone, and I'll show you that shortly. So uh, I just want to bring that forward to that you have the ability to control when you do and don't get that uh, get that call. So as we say here, the mobility router function is to enable the ability to connect remotely through the internet. That, act, that is actually a VoIP call, by the way. That Wi-Fi call is a VoIP call. You can have it connected through your corporate Wi-Fi locally, and that also is a VoIP call. And if the ability to make a VoIP call isn't there, we can actually make that as a cellular call, and we can still complete that call so that it completes to the, to the spot type. Um, the next slide that I'm going to bring up, this one, by the way, just is a point of reference. This, this actually comes right out of the Michael uh, Mobility Administration guy, it's a very good architecture photograph. Um, the next one that I want to bring up for you is um, uh, a personal diagram that I've put together, and I use this to, uh, when I'm working with folks implementing the mobility router, kind of give them a little bit of a clearer picture of how those pieces go together. Uh, this is really more of a connectivity diagram, if you would. Um, with our mobility router, um, it is, by nature of its name, it's a router. So it is routing between two networks or two interfaces. Um, so it does have two interfaces. It has an Ethernet Zero interface that connects to your voice private network. And then it has an Ethernet One, which is connected via your DMZ uh, to your firewall. Um, we only allow, this is a secure connection that we're making when we come through the internet. We only allow TCP and UDP 443 traffic uh, to establish that tunnel through the firewall. Um, and any other traffic that comes to our interface uh, that is not known as accepted and utilizing those port and protocols gets rejected. So that's, that's important to, to be aware of. Um, we do use certificates. Uh, for authentication as well, so um, we, we have um, certificates that would be installed on the mobility router. We use FQDNs out in the public world for that to connect to, so it makes it easier for your users to configure. Um, but those two red, those two sets of red lines that we saw on the last diagram, I've separated them here uh, from an from an integration perspective. The mobility router's connection back into the PDX has two components. Um, the dark heavy line here 
uh, is a SIP tie trunk from one of your uh, IPTVX switches to the mobility router, and this is used for the, um, the call and the voice passing back and forth. Uh, and then the broken uh, yellow line, orange line here, is what's called the line side integration. And this is what's establishing your connection coming in to the account on the mobility router to that additional phone that's going to register on the PDX as a SIP phone. Um, we'll be real, real um, clear on that. Um, there is a SIP phone registration that occurs that becomes that additional phone I was talking about. That does require an IP phone resource. Uh, there was a previous question regarding licensing. Um, so there is an IP phone resource that is used for each connection that comes back in through. So we have to make sure we have capacity to address that. Um, we do pass through this uh, to your shoreware director for authentication. Um, so Mobility Router has the capability of having the Mobility account uh, be completely self-contained within the Mobility Router. It has its own um, security database. So I'll have a username and password in that database on the Mobility Router itself. Uh, but our preferred um, way of configuring that is to actually pass that through so that it uses the same username and password that you use for your um, your Connect client, right? Um, and and we, we limit the number of security databases that are out there. So from a management perspective, that, that helps clean that up a great bit. Um, that is really the connectivity. Like I say, it's an interface in the DMZ, has its own DMZ IP address, has a public IP address that has the NAT translation to it uh, for TCP and UDP 443. Uh, and then we have a set of SIP trunks between the PDX and the mobility router. And then we have what's called the line side integration that allows that account on the mobility router to provision on the system as a SIP phone for that additional phone. So I, I, I just, this diagram is kind of a little bit simpler. Uh, and, and from a, a, a deployment perspective, it, it, it makes a little bit more sense. So um, the next thing I want to bring up for you then is going to be the interface. If you've not seen this before, uh, this may be new to you. Let me see if I can get that moved over there. Please stand by. Okay. Um, here's an interface that you're probably all familiar with. You've probably all seen uh, your login to director. Um, and, and that's what it looks like. Um, most of your devices you configure in director under appliances and server. You go to platform equipment um, and you select your device and, and you work on its configuration. You'll notice that the mobility router does not show up in here. It's, it configures as a separate device. With its own interface, and I didn't want that to be the inactivity. There we go. Um, so this is the mobility router's interface. It has a great deal of capability in here, as you can see, just right out of the gate. We've got some dashboards up here that shows us some call statistics and real-time statistics. Shows us our licensing, where our top five users are, our call mixes, um, and our system status, right? So these are all great, you know, quick view to look at. And these can be adjusted, which by the way, you can take that from, let's say, the last 24 hours to say, you know, the last hour, the last seven days, whatever. Um, so that's that's always very good. You can also notice that there are, uh, or there is the ability to uh, we don't have active calls currently, but you could actually see active calls on here. If we made a test call, uh, we would be able to see um, you know, the VoIP duration, cell duration, how many times is that call handed over, right? and the total call duration. These are all very relevant when it comes to uh, troubleshooting, uh, users reporting that they're having challenges or not being able to um, you know, transition a call or something along those lines. So these are very, very good, very good reporting within the system. Um, if we go under the configuration, 
this is kind of where all the magic starts to happen. Um, <clears throat> with most things in the MyTrail system, I, I learned this years ago when I started the Short Trail 5, um, and one of their engineers taught me this trick, and it really makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, typically, you build from the bottom up, and then you configure for, or you administer from the top down. Um, so, to kind of show you how these pieces go together, uh, if we go under system and start there, obviously this is where your licensing is on with uh, mobility version 9 and uh, 9.1 9 and up and connect. Um, we don't have to actually go in and add licensing in here. I have these in here. That's residual uh, from when we originally deployed our mobility router a number of years ago. Uh, the date and time, obviously, if you want to set your date and time, this is where that comes in, and TP settings, those types of things. Um, the authentication, this is where we can make that determination uh, as to whether I'm going to have a local user database uh, or if I'm going to go through the directory. Um, and I can also set ordering. I can do combinations thereof. Right? I can say admin authentication or user authentication. And I can say you know, go local, go LDAP, go local, go uh, directory is another option there. Um, that's where we can figure those out. As I referred to earlier, we do want to use certificates with these. Um, there's a remote access that's for the outside coming in, and a local access that's on the inside when we're accessing. Um, mobility router from the local from the local side. <clears throat> here's, the, here's the real nuts and bolts. Um, if we go in, there's our Ethernet Zero interface. You'll see that sits on my private voice network. Uh, my Ethernet One interface sits in my DMZ as a separate IP range. Uh, and then for remote access, allowing people to come in from the outside. Uh, I have a remote access FQDN. That's that FQ, that that FQDN there is in my public DNS, and it resolves to this IP address, and that matches against my uh, valid third-party certificate domain, uh, which allows that that connection to be secured. <laughs> the routing and those types of things were not really needing to do a whole lot there unless you have multiple remote sites in your private network. That's where that would be addressed. Um, but then when we get into this, this is where we, inter we now integrate with our PDX. Okay. Um, what we do is we come in here into the IP PDXs and you'll see I have one configured here. Um, and what we have is <coughs> excuse me. This will be for that line side integration that I was referring to before. And you'll notice that I'm going to a new phone switch. That would be any of your PDX phones that are capable of having IP phone resources on them. So um, an SG3050, 90, an ST100, um, those switches where you would um, register your IP phones. So I've told the mobility router. Here's the IP address, here's the FQDN name of the switch that you go to for registering the phones. And then in our PBX settings, I've also told it, here's the trunk switch that you go to, and here's his IP address, um, for establishing SIP trunks. So when it goes to send that SIP invite, right, that's, that's the IP address that it sends it to, the switch that it sends it to. Um, we do have a numbering plan associated here for our 804 area code. Uh, we won't get into the nuts and bolts of that, uh, but that's basically how we normalize numbers uh, as we pass them back and forth between the two systems. Um, the access numbers, this is important. You'll notice here we have the SMR access numbers. Um, and if we look at those, this is those three DIDs uh, that I referred to that we needed to have. So these are DIDs that are on our SIP trunks in our PBX that have caller ID. And that is very important. It has to have caller ID. It recognizes the function and who's calling it on that function based on the caller ID. Um, the access number is used if I'm going to make a phone call from my mobility client 
and I'll, we have a cellular connection. It dials the access number, and then it pulses the digits that I've dialed to the mobility router, and then it reaches into the PBX and establishes the call. Um, the handover number is used as signaling. Uh, if I'm already on a call and I want to do a handover, when I push that handover button, it sends a signal to the mobility router, which initiates a call to the mobility router through the secondary path, and then it joins the two calls together, just like a conference call would. So that's the reason that we have those DIDs and that they, they're in the system. So that's from the mobility router side how we connect these two together. And the, the two biggest pieces of that, obviously, are going to be that line side integration and then the trunk side integration. And if we look at that in the director, the switch that I was pointing to, the V phone switch, right? That's the 1099-2157. Um, that switch, if we look at its capabilities, I think it shows it on here, yes. Um, there's its IP phone capacities. There's how many are in use, so I have plenty of IP phone resources available. But it's also important to know that this is the SIP proxy switch for that site. Okay? And that's why we point at this switch. So when we're configuring that line side integration here, Right, we have to make sure that the phone that we're the switch that we're sending that to is the SIP proxy because what we're trying to do when we send our signaling to it is to establish a SIP phone on the system. So we have to send that to the proxy switch. Um, and then here's my V trunk switch where I'm establishing those trunks. Um, the trunk establishments uh, are done via a trunk group. So there's my SMR, my mobility router. I have 40 trunks, and it has you know, all of the appropriate um, trunk settings that we would need. And then we create, coming from that, that V trunk switch, a group of SIP trunks that go to that mobility router's IP address, 151. So that's how those pieces kind of marry together. Now, one thing that I would show you on this, um, there is established um, a set of all system extensions for that trunk group, and that's how we send those three control numbers, those three control DIDs, um, to the mobility router. When it comes into the PDX, uh, it goes and it hits. Um, those DIDs are assigned um, to a route point that points it to those off-system extensions to that trunk group, and that's how they get routed across. Um, what I would like to show you next is how we get a user into that system. Once we got those pieces and parts all put together, um, we create a couple of groups on here. Uh, I create a group for the iPhones, and I create a group for the Androids. Typically, those settings are, you know, all going to work for both, but there are some intricacies with the Androids where we may need to modify a couple of those settings that the iPhone wouldn't necessarily need. So we can, you know, if I, if I had an Android user, I put them in the Android group. If I had an iPhone user, I put them in the iPhone group. That way, if we need to make a modification, it impacts the correct group of users. Um, but the users themselves, and I'll pick on myself. Um, well, the first thing I want to show you here real quick, this is good. Um, when, when you come into this, you'll see that there's an admin status and an opera status. And what that is is administrative status and operational status. Administrative status means that there is an appropriate license uh, for the user. The operational status means that the user is enabled, right? And that user can be uh, disabled. The button right there for it, I can disable myself very quickly. Um, but I'm going to go into this is what the settings look like. We would come to create a new user. We would say put them in the iPhone user group. It's user ID is K right, and yes, that does match my user name and director. Um, 
Um, so that union does match there. Uh, and because we're using a pass-through authentication, you'll notice there is not a password field here, right? So my user ID is KWrite, my name is Kurt Wright, I am enabled. Uh, and then here's that line size integration where I said 7222 is my extension. There's my Enterprise phone number. So now you all have my direct dial number too. <laughs> um, and then on the PBX side security, this is where we establish that line side integration where we create that additional phone or that SIP registration for that additional phone. Um, and you'll notice this is a little bit different. And this is how I'm coming here to point this out. The way this thing puts together is over here on the telephony tab. This is where I enable a user to be able to be mobility enabled. So I and check that box that says enable enhanced mobility with extension. And that'll be blank initially, and this will be blank initially. When you hit save, it'll populate just the first available extension on the system that's not in use and it creates this mobility client ID. And that is very, very relevant because this is actually the user ID that's used to establish that line size integration or that SIP phone. Um, and it gets a little tricky because the SIP password is actually on this general tab here down here where it says SIP phone password. Um, and when you go into this, you know, if you're an administrator, you will have gone in and you'll see the blanks with the little dots there and you know that the default password is changing. Well, that's a little bit of a red herring on the SIP phone password. You have the dots, but it is empty. You actually have to type that password in there twice. Um, very important. And save that. So then when you go into your user creation, you put that mobility extension or user ID that was created here with that SIP phone password. And what you see is those two are not matched properly is you will see here under monitoring under users you'll notice that oh, here's a good example mr kelsey you notice his, his pdx registration status is rejected and what that means is is that his account on the mobility router attempted to reach back into the pdx and authenticate using that um that mobility user ID that was created along with that SIP password and that authentication failed. So it rejected it. So how would we create how we, the way we would resolve that obviously or, or, or remediate that would be to go back in and validate these settings for his user account. <clears throat> so that that's a the big part of putting that forward is to say that's that's how those pieces integrate together. Um, and that, that's kind of what makes them work. Now, uh, one other thing that I really want to show you while I was in here, because in the TDX, right, I'm back on my user account here. If I go in and I look in the routing, when I create that mobility, when I enable my user for mobility, it will automatically add the My Mobility app with that extension and that username as one of the additional phones. So there's the phone. When I go to the ring me um, tab under routing, um, these check boxes are the ones that say, will I send that call to the mobility extension when a call comes into the DID? So right now mine is set to when I'm available, when I'm in a meeting, when I'm out of office. So I'm pretty much just that non-come to me whenever, you know, whenever it's there. Um, so if I if I wanted to be say if I want to say I'm sitting in my desk and when I'm in that available state I don't want it to ring my mobility, you would simply uncheck that and save that. Um, it's real important to point that out, and the reason is this: um, a lot of times uh, we will get a support call that comes in that says, "Well, mobility's not working." You try to call this guy, and the call's not getting there. Well, one of the reasons that that happens is because that user happens to be in an availability state or in a call handling mode state um, that has ring me unchecked. Right, so the call is getting 
to the extension, but it's not going to mobility because it's been told in the user settings to when I'm, when I'm in this mode, don't go there. Um, so that's one of the, the big reasons for pointing that out. Um, another thing to be very cognizant of um, is this number of rings. Um, three is a common, you'll see that as a common default. Um, when you, you consider what's happening, the calls coming into the system to the DID, and then it's getting forwarded to the mobility router, which is then going to find the cell phone, right? Find the mobile phone to make it start ringing. You know, there's a there's a there's a time lapse that happens between when the desk phone rings and when the mobile phone rings. Um, so we want to extend that number of rings to give it a better opportunity to get there. Uh, there's a secondary place for that also in the availability states, by the way, just so you, un so you understand those as well. Um, your call forward conditions, right? What's my no answer busy? And when will that forward? Well, if I set this one to six and I leave this at three, if a call comes in, it rings three times at my desk, it may only get to my cell phone in time to ring once before this forward condition actually sends it to voicemail. So these are just kind of common things that we see that you know that, that people call in for um, and, and say, hey, this is not functioning the way we expect it to. Um, and, and what we find is we come in here and we look and we go, okay, well, yeah, it's not functioning because the configuration is put together in such a way that it's going to make it a, a challenge for the call to, to reach the, the end user. Yeah, that's um, an interesting point, so Kurt. There's, a, there's actually a question. Uh, on the screen, we're actually at the 2:45 mark, where we can take some questions. There's a question as to sort yeah. of, you know, the statement was made in not so many words, just it looks like a complex uh, kind of piecing together of the technology. Um, the question was, you know, what are the top three uh, stumbling blocks or the the top three issues that customers face here? If I can, I can take that question first and and speak to it from a user standpoint um, <clears throat> you know from an from an application user standpoint the the iPhone is a little different than the Android client uh, Android is a little bit more of an open operating system than iOS is from Apple and so there's some tighter controls available on an Android although it put it poses other challenges that the iPhone handles a little cleaner as well. So it's not exactly the same on an iPhone versus an Android interface. And particularly, uh, Apple sort of has this rule that uh, when you when you tap a phone number in an iPhone, it's going to call using the native dialer, right? The little green application, because that's the built-in Apple native dialer. And so from, you know, some stumbling blocks, sometimes it takes the end user a little bit of time to navigate and understand, hey, if I'm going to make a business call, I can't just tap a phone or my email because that's going to make it a personal call. I have to copy and paste that number into my application. That's on an iPhone. Now, on Android, I believe, I'm not much of an Android user, but when I've seen it demoed before, uh, Android actually allows you to select the application you wish to dial from and so you hold the number and you press it a little harder and it pops up do you want to call using the Android phone app or the connect app and so it allows you a little bit more flexibility and ease of making calls between different profiles um, so I think from a from an end user perspective that's what I would say is one of sort of the big learnings that we've seen people is navigating the app a little bit and just takes a little bit of understanding as to, uh, you know, being able to make a business call from your personal iPhone just takes one extra step. And that is really just a cut and paste of that number into, uh, into the right spot or just typing the number through the dialer on the Connect client. Kurt, what would, how would you answer that question from an administrative or a technical standpoint? What are maybe one or two of the main things that we see our customers experience that cause uh, support issues or confusion or something that they just want to um, need a little bit of help with because obviously IPC will help you get all this infrastructure set up 
Uh, and once it's set up, it just, it works. Uh, but along the way, and some but, user things that might go bump in the night, what what would you say, Kurt? Yeah. I would agree with you, Eric. The, your, your statement of once the infrastructure is configured, so those configuration pieces that I was showing you, once they're in place, they just work. It's typically more towards the end user, and it's these things, uh, the last pieces that I was going over here, things like the availability states and when we get the call to the mobile phone and how many rings we get it to get there and make sure, making sure we give it enough time to get there, that is a, that is a really big uh, or common uh, um, stumbling block, block that we run into with folks. The other is the provisioning um, and making sure that you know, those, those, use, those user ID and passwords are matching properly and that the user is in that state. Um, the biggest thing that I would say, Eric, from a, 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 you know, once it's implemented up and running from a usability perspective, is going to be training. I uh, highly, highly, highly recommend training the users, having training presented to the users. Um, because getting the proper expectation, it, it's, it, it is an advanced technology. It has a great deal of capability. So getting the right expectation with the end user set um, and having them properly trained will minimize the number of calls uh, to, the, to the client help, to the customer help desk, um, which in turn is fear of false <laughs> Um So, you know, it, it's, we, we have found historically that training is, is you know, end user training is, is a really big piece of this. I will say, though, that once you do get the application and understand how to use it. I, I use mine all the time when I'm traveling, um, and it's for multiple reasons. One is when I want to have a quick chat with someone uh, in my organization, I've got the ability to send them an instant message through that application, and they could be working at their desk, or they could be on their mobile application traveling somewhere else. They could be on a customer site. So it allows me to send a quick little instant message through the application, I can send it to a team of people or a group or an individual, and I can have these conversations uh, with instant messaging that's a corporate-based instant messaging. The other thing that I like about it is that I can protect uh, two, two things. One, from a user perspective, I can protect that personal cell phone number. Um, my signature block has one number. And that number rings my desk phone or my cell phone or my mobile client or my soft phone based on my availability and how my calendar adjusts throughout the day dynamically through the My Voice Connect platform. But I don't, I don't want to have my personal cell phone uh, be widely available. And so I can protect, I can make a call at any time to my customers and my coworkers using my professional identity because my personal cell phone is personal. Now, from an end user perspective, that's an advantage. From a business owner's perspective, what you get to do is you get to protect the corporate identity of the phone number, right? So a real easy example is uh, we find this solution is uh, highly desirable in auto dealerships. Why do automotive de dealerships like the solution? Well, there's a pretty high turnover rate, generally speaking, with salespeople at automotive dealerships. But as a salesperson, I need to be mobile and I need to always get those phone calls. And as a dealership manager, a general manager of a dealership or an owner, I can say, okay, Mr. Customer. Oh, there's your kids. Um, uh, <laughs> I can say... <laughs> Okay, Mr. Mr. Salesman, I'm going to give you an application that will give you that mobility that you desire to make sales, but you can't give out your personal cell phone number. I want you giving out a dealership number for people to meet to meet you remotely. And the reason they want to do that is again because of the high turnover potential of salespeople in the industry because last week I was talking to Joe Smith, the sales guy at the Honda dealership. And guess what? Over the weekend, he got a better offer over at Toyota. So if I call that cell phone number that he's been giving me, 
I'm not going to call over at Honda. He's over at Toyota. And he'll answer that cell phone and say, nah, nah, you don't want that Honda. That thing's a piece of junk. You want to buy this new Toyota for me because I'm over here at the Toyota dealership. And so by allowing the application to be deployed in the sales team, what you get is control of that number. So the person is not allowed to hand out their personal cell number. They hand out the dealership number. So the same scenario, Joe Smith leaves Honda goes to Toyota, I'm still calling the Honda-owned number, and the next sales guy that took his place has that number on his mobile device. Hi, this is Bob. Yes, Joe is no longer with us, but I'm aware of what he's been working with you on. Come on by. We got your Honda all ready to go. And so from a protection standpoint, from a business leadership standpoint, you protect that important asset of your identity as a company and a phone number can 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 be that corporate identity that's not pushed to personal cell phones. So we got a couple more minutes and left uh, now, under the hour. Go ahead, Kurt. No, no, I was going to say plus in addition to that, um, his his corporate phone number and, and corporate extension is now Wi-Fi. So the the salesman the salesman is not tied to a desk. He's he's out on the sales floor or out on the sales lot. Um, working with the customers and still being able to make him take his call. Right. So we've reached our Q&A section. We're sort of doing that now. Let me just check one last time to see if there's any other questions that have popped in since we've begun. Uh, yeah, so there's a question there. When a user leaves the company, how is the application removed from the personal phone? That's a great question. Um, what happens is that the the application on the phone, if you do not have a mobile device management platform, which is how you would do it, you don't actually need to remove the app from the phone. You just disable the user centrally. So if if Kurt Wright were to leave IPC, God forbid, um, we would go into that admin interface and simply disable Kurt Wright. So the next time that he launched that application from his personal phone, he would no longer be authorized to access that service. So that's a great question. So you do not have to remove it from the remote user's phone. You simply disable the user so that the next time they try to connect in, they receive not authorized, username, password, incorrect, and they can no longer use that service. So it's all centrally managed. It's kind of like if you have a laptop and you're looking at Exchange email, you simply disable the user. You don't have to remove the uh, the application from the laptop. You just remove their access to the centralized service. But that's a great question. Shows that you understand kind of some of the challenges that might pose with a mobile uh, mobile deployment for the, your road warriors. But there's a good answer for that one. Thank you for that question. Very good. So um, one of the things I did want to do here is uh, let's see. Coming soon, uh, we do have we do do these sessions every two weeks. So uh, if you've liked what you've heard, we we sort of mix up presenters so that you get a, a good taste and a good flavor of the talent we have here at IPC Technologies. Uh, the next one, if you are considering a move to SIP away from your traditional trunk lines, we have a uh, we have a session coming up on the 19th of November, which will talk about how we, how would you migrate to a SIP based call trunking, uh, trunking into your My Voice Connect or your My Voice Business solution. After that, we got a better work at home strategy, similar to a road, a road warrior, but slightly different, right? A work from home strategy is I've got a home office that I'm going to be sitting at. And so the technology to deliver a teleworker is a little different than a road warrior because we're not, right, a road warrior could be a teleworker, but a teleworker doesn't have to be a road warrior. Uh, say that five times fast. But what uh, what a work from home strategy would be would be deploying physical phones out in people's homes to deliver on that teleworking strategy that you may be considering implementing, but you're not sure how to do it from a communication standpoint. And then uh, uh, in December, I'm pretty sure we're not going to do that on the 20. Of, uh, of we're not going to do that on Christmas Eve, so we might have to push that date, I believe, to another time. We're not going to. I'm not going to be here on Christmas Eve talking about that. Um, 
But we're going to have our next session is going to be how do I decide if I'm ready to move to a cloud based solution? IPC has customers that are on premise. We have customers that are cloud. We have premise customers that have moved to the cloud. We have cloud customers that have moved to premise. It's all based on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, are you scaling up? Are you scaling down? Um, what kind of infrastructure you have. So we're going to have some just some real dialogue about uh, actual cases of why people have moved to the cloud and why they moved away from the cloud in, helps, in hopes that it helps uh, formulate your decisions on what to do next. A lot of times people say, what should I do? And so we're going to try to answer that question. And the short answer is it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. So it's not for everybody. So that's what's coming soon. Uh, Kurt, thank you so much for uh, the education today on the mobility router and some of the, the challenges associated with that and some of the advantages associated with it. We hope you have found this session helpful and we look forward and hope you can join us on our next one. Thanks so much and everybody have a great rest of your Tuesday.